The Nintendo 64 is a console with a lot of history behind it, a great catalog of games, and a lot of controversy with emulators. Released on September 26, 1996 in North America, three days before its slated release date, it was widely received with positive reviews, and by the end of 1997, at least 3.6 million units had been sold in the US, increasing Nintendo sales in their North American market by 156%. However, little did Nintendo know, they were about to receive quite a fright by the emulation community in the following years. I'm Too Late Nate, and you're watching the early history of Nintendo 64 emulation. The earliest recorded emulator for the Nintendo 64 is Project Unreality, developed by Michael Tedder and others for the Microsoft Windows platform. Many believe that the emulator was first released in May of 1998, but really, Project Unreality was initially released on February 27th of 1998, just a little over a full year or 17 months after Nintendo 64 had hit shelves in the US. It was able to run several homebrew applications and a few startup screens for commercial games when there were many fake emulators being released and shell-only emulators that emulated very basic functions of the console. I believe that the name Project Unreality was coined from Nintendo's own Project Reality which began in 1993, later becoming the Ultra 64, which then eventually became the Nintendo 64. Project Unreality proved that emulation of Nintendo's newest console was achievable, creating quite a buzz on the internet. The Nintendo 64 startup logo of both Mortal Kombat Trilogy and Wave Race 64 could be seen, which at the time was more than any other emulator had done until this point. Unfortunately, it was declared by Mr. Tedder that Project Unreality would be stuck on the back burner for a little while, as the two main developers had decided to take up employment offers and develop commercial Nintendo 64 games. The news was more than a little disheartening for some, as this was the first emulator to actually make discernible progress towards running commercial games. This was when the Great Sweep of 1998 happened wiping out many emulator projects and websites where the emulation scene developed, and in my opinion was one of the greatest tragedies of the internet at that time. I genuinely believe this vicious attack by the IDSA, or Interactive Digital Software Association, now called the ESA, or Entertainment Software Association, is why we lost a great deal of information that wasn't already archived, but we'll talk about that more in a later video. It would only be a year later, in 1999, when the emulation scene would receive several fantastic projects, some even being commercially backed. But our focus is on two small-time developers named Reality Man and Epsilon, who took the world by storm on January 28, 1999 with their emulator Ultra HLE. The name, I believe, was coined from both the Ultra 64 title and HLE, or High Level Emulation. When the emulator was first released, it was a massive success. Even IGN reviewed the emulator on the same day as release, so you can imagine how big this emulator quickly became. It ran Mario 64, The Legend of Zelda, and 15 other games almost flawlessly with full sound support. Because of the nature of the high level emulation, the emulator takes a reasonable guess at what function the game is trying to call and does just that. With just enough accuracy, this makes emulating some games a breeze, but with others that make certain weird calls to the console, it creates a nightmare to figure out what the game is trying to do. This was a complete turnaround compared to other projects that were simply trying to digitally recreate or reverse engineer the console in their entirety. Ultra HLE was working on a per game basis, and while not being the most accurate emulator, it was very fast and showed extreme progress very quickly. The emulator's minimum requirements were a paltry Pentium 2 at 233 MHz, 32 MB of RAM, and a Voodoo 1 3D accelerator card, while the ideal specs for the emulator were a Pentium 2 at 400 MHz, 64 MB of RAM, and either a Voodoo 2 or Voodoo Banshee accelerator. If you didn't know, 3DFX was a company that created a 3D accelerated graphics card series called Voodoo, which this emulator required in order to run. However, others reported that using a 3DFX glide wrapper or emulator worked, even if performance did take a noticeable hit. 
If you want any more information on Voodoo or 3DFX Glide, I will happily recommend Phil Computer Lab's 3DFX video, which I'll link in the description, as I feel this covers the subject very well. Yes sir, the future of emulation seemed pretty amazing. People were in awe that they could play their favorite Nintendo 64 titles right on their PC. Except, it wasn't all roses. In fact, the emulation scene really showed its ugly side. While some people were congratulating the two devs on a job well done, others were very demanding of the developers, constantly harassing them for code or ROM dumps, update times, and so on. It became so bad that just six hours after the release of Ultra HLE, it was discontinued with just one of the devs saying they were going to delete the source code ending Ultra HLE just as soon as it began. However, it wasn't just the community that had gotten the best of Reality Man and Epsilon during that time. In fact, it was much more frightening than that. The news that Sony would take Connectix to court for their emulator was far-reaching. The following day, there were some announcements that Ultra HLE may continue since things had gotten somewhat heated in the previous night. However, Nintendo also announced that they were reviewing all of their possible legal options against the developers of Ultra HLE, essentially forcing the official project to close by Nintendo simply flexing its legal muscle. In February, Nintendo stated that it would sue both the developers of Ultra HLE for believing that it was an illegal product, since the project could not properly run homebrew titles or anything that was in a commercial title, thereby promoting piracy. This decision came after the fact that Sony had decidedly sued Connectix over their PlayStation 1 emulator. Feeling emboldened, Nintendo decided to release the Hounds, or so history would have written. Fortunately for the two developers, a growing support of boycotting Nintendo and all Nintendo products had started after the announcement of legal action. This, coupled with a certain programmer releasing the source code for Ultra HLE, made the potential backlash from fans and customers outweigh the gains from such a legal suit. Though I speculate that Nintendo's lawyers simply knew that their case wouldn't hold up in court, but that the legal pressure on a fragmented and small emulation community would be enough to halt the developers until the Nintendo 64 was discontinued, since this is when Project Dolphin started coming to fruition. As a side note, this scared the entire Nintendo emulation community so bad that some developers almost instantly abandoned their projects when they heard the whispers of Nintendo's legal wrath. With some SNES and NES emulation sites shutting down for a few days, I consider this a spook factor felt from the previous year's great sweep mentioned earlier in this video. Things calmed down eventually, but the official Ultra HLE project was dead making it one of the shortest-lived popular emulators to ever be produced. Notice though, I said official project. An unofficial fork of the project had taken place as Ultra HLE-Z that continued into 2002. Ultra HLP was born, a small utility that added various features like better two-player support, full key customization, mouse support, and a full debug screen. In fact, this tool was so good that it was integrated into Ultra HLEZ along with several any file hacks which made many more games playable on Ultra HLE. So in essence, while Ultra HLE died hours after being brought into the emulation scene, its legacy carried on in Ultra HLE-Z and Ultra HLE 2064. However, we really shouldn't be talking about early N64 emulation without mentioning an emulator that was well known for its debugging prowess. Nemu64. This emulator was pretty incredible from what I remember, with a plug-in system later used by both Project 64 and Mupin64 Plus for a short time. Nemu64 wasn't known for its speed or accessibility, but rather its extensive feature list that other emulators continued to copy for quite some time, including net play, free camera movement, texture dumper, geometry dumper, and much more made this emulator a fantastic debugging tool for future emulator makers and homebrew developers. All three of these projects helped shape Nintendo 64 emulation as we know it today, proving that high-level emulation is an accessible route and can be much more than a stopgap measure, but it can also be a learning tool for future developers. Hey everyone! I really hope you guys enjoyed the video. Um, if you could, leave a like. Uh, it really helps. Share the video with your friends, among your community, your discords, really helps. 
uh, the more people that see the videos, the better off I am, and the better off they are for seeing the video. Um, yeah, this one was uh, this one was a little interesting to uh, make. Not only did it cover a bunch of different topics, but there was just wildly different amounts of accusations, and I had to tunnel through a lot of data, and a lot of data that went to dead ends because it doesn't exist anymore, and that was real fun to do. So I apologize if that took a little uh, longer than I hoped, and it, it did. I expected to get this out on the 8th of January, and I got it on the 10th of February. So my whole thing about these videos is that they take a long time for me to edit. Um, so what I'm thinking about doing is maybe doing a different form of them, which you'll see in the next video. Which I don't really know which one I want to do. I want to do more of the Game Boy Advance ones, but I also don't want to stay with Nintendo. I was thinking about doing more of a, and I know I said I wasn't going to do these, but like a top 10 kind of video. Um, just like 10 facts you may have not known or something like that. I feel like that cheapens the experience, and that's why I haven't done them, but... So in the comments down below, uh, if you guys could kindly just let me know what you guys want to see, and I'll see what I can do. But yeah, again, I hope you guys enjoy the video. I hope you learned a lot. I certainly did going through all this information. I will see you guys in the next video. And as always, 